Section 2 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Matilda of Flanders, Chapter 1, Part 2. When William first made known to his Norman peers his positive intention of asserting, by force of arms, his claims to the crown of England, on the plea of Edward the Confessor's verbal adoption of himself as successor to that realm, there were stormy debates among them on the subject. They were then assembled in the hall of Lillibon, where they remained long in council, but chiefly employed in complaining to one another of the warlike temper of their lord. There were, however, great differences of opinion among them, and they separated themselves into several distinct groups, because many chose to speak at once, and no one could obtain the attention of the whole assembly, but harangued as many hearers as could be prevailed on to listen to him. The majority were opposed to the idea of the expedition to England, and said they had already been grievously taxed to support the Duke's foreign wars, and observed that they were not only poor, but in debt. While others were no less vehement in advocating their sovereign's project, and spake of the propriety of contributing ships and men, and crossing the sea with him. Some said they would, others that they would not and at last the contention among them became so fierce, that Fitz Osborne of Bretoul, surnamed the Proud Spirit, stood forth and harangued the malcontent portion of the assembly in these words. Why should you go on wrangling with your natural lord, who seeks to gain honor? You owe him service for your fiefs, and you ought to render it with all readiness. Instead of waiting for him to entreat you, you ought to hasten to him, and offer your assistance, that he may not hereafter complain that his design has failed through your delays. Sir, they replied, we fear the sea, and we are not bound to serve beyond it. But do you speak to the duke for us? For we do not seem to know our own minds, and we think you will decide better for us than we can do for ourselves. Fitz Osborne, thus empowered to act as their deputy, went to the duke at their head and in their names made him the most unconditional pro-offers of their assistance and cooperation. Behold, said Fitz Osborne, the loving loyalty of your lieges, my lord, and their zeal for your service. They will pass with you over sea and double their accustomed service. He who is bound to furnish twenty knights will bring forty. He who should serve you with thirty will now serve you with sixty and he who owes one hundred will cheerfully pay two hundred. For myself, I will, in good love to my sovereign in his need, contribute sixty well-appointed ships charged with fighting men. Here the dissentient barons interrupted him, with a clamor of disapprobation, exclaiming, that he might give as much as he pleased himself, but they had never empowered him to promise such unheard-of aids for them and they would submit to no such exactions from their sovereign, since if they once performed double service, it would henceforth be demanded of them as a right. In short, continues the lively chronicler, they raised such an uproar that no one could hear another speak, no one could either listen to reason or render it for himself. Then the duke, being greatly perplexed with the noise, withdrew, and sending for the barons one by one, exerted all his powers of persuasion, to induce them to accede to his wishes, promising to reward them richly with Saxon spoils for the assistance he now required at their hands. And if they felt disposed to make good Fitz Osborne's offer of double service at that time, he should receive it as a proof of their loyal affection, and never think of demanding it as a right on any future occasion. The nobles, on this conciliatory address, were pacified, and feeling that it was a much easier thing to maintain their opposition to their sovereign's wishes, in the council than in the presence chamber, began to assume a different tone, and even to express their willingness to oblige him as far as it lay in their power. William next invited his neighbors, the Bretons, 
the Agavins, and men of Boulogne, to join his banners, bribing them with promises of good pay, and a share in the spoils of merry England. He even proposed to take the King of France into the alliance, offering, if he would assist him with the quota of money, men, and ships, which he required, to own him for the suzerain, or paramount lord of England, as well as Normandy, and to render him a liegeman's homage for that island, as well as for his continental dominions. Philip treated the idea of William's annexing England to Normandy as an extravagant chimera, and he asked, who would take care of his duchy while he was running after a kingdom? To this sarcastic query, William replied, that it is a care that should not need to trouble our neighbors. By the grace of God, we are blessed with a prudent wife and loving subjects, who will keep our border securely during our absence. William entreated the young Count, Baldwin of Flanders, the brother of his duchess, to accompany him as a friendly ally. But the wily Fleming, with whom the family connection seems to have had but little weight, replied by asking William, what share of England he intended to bestow on him by way of recompense. The duke, surprised at this demand, told his brother-in-law that he could not satisfy him on that point till he had consulted with his barons on the subject. But instead of naming the matter to them, he took a piece of fair parchment, and having folded it in the form of a letter, he superscribed it to Count Baldwin of Flanders, and sealed it with the ducal seal, and wrote the following distich on the label that surrounded the scroll. Beaufrere, in Angleterre vous aurez, c'est qui de dens, escrit vous trouverez, which is to say, brother-in-law, I give you such a share of England as you shall find within this letter. He sent the letter to the count by a shrewd-witted page, who was much in his confidence. When Baldwin had read this promising endorsement, he broke the seal, full of expectation, but finding the parchment blank, he showed it to the bearer, and asked what it was the duke's meaning. Not is written here, replied the messenger, and not shall thou receive, therefore look for nothing. The honor that the duke seeks will be for the advantage of your sister and her children, and their greatness will be the advancement of yourself, and the benefit will be felt by your country. But if you refuse your aid, then, with the blessing of God, my lord will conquer England without your help. But though William ventured, by means of this sarcastic device, to reprove the selfish feelings manifested by his brother-in-law, he was fain to subscribe to the only terms on which the aid of Matilda's father could be obtained, which was by securing to him and his successors a perpetual pension of three hundred marks of silver annually, in the event of his succeeding in establishing himself as king of England. According to the Flemish historians, this pension was actually paid during the life of Baldwin V and his son Baldwin VI, but afterwards discontinued. It is certain that Matilda's family connections rendered the most important assistance to William in the conquest of England, and her countrymen were among his bravest auxiliaries. The Earl of Flanders was, in fact, the first person to commence hostilities against Harold, by furnishing the traitor Tostig with ships and a military force to make a descent on England. Tostig executed his mission more like a pirate brigand than an accredited leader. The brave earls Morcar and Edwin drove him into Scotland, whence he passed into Norway, where he succeeded in persuading King Harfager to invade England at one point simultaneously with William of Normandy's attack in another quarter of the island. The minds of the people of England in general were, at this momentous crisis, laboring under a painful depression, occasioned by the appearance of the splendid three-tailed comet, which became visible in their horizon at the commencement of the memorable year 1066, a few days before the death of King Edward. The unsettled state of the succession, and the superstitious spirit of the age, inclined all classes of people to regard, with ominous feelings of dismay, any phenomenon which could be construed into a portent of evil. Moreover, the astrologers who had foretold the approach of this comet, had thought proper to announce their prediction in an oracular Latin distich, of which the following rude couplet is a literal translation. In the year 1066, Comets to England's sons an end shall fix. 
About this time, says Malmesbury, a comet or star, denoting, as they say, a change in kingdoms, appeared trailing its extended and fiery train along the sky. Wherefore a certain monk of our monastery named Elmer, bowing down with terror when the bright star first became visible to his eye, prophetically exclaimed, Thou art come, a matter of great lamentation to many a mother art thou come. I have seen thee long before, but now I behold thee in thy terrors, threatening destruction to this country. Ways, whom we may almost regard in the light of a contemporary chronicler, in still quainter language describes the appearance of this comet, and the impression it made on the unphilosophical stargazers of the eleventh century. This year a great star appeared in the heavens, shining for fourteen days, with three long rays streaming towards the south, such a star as is wont to be seen, when a kingdom is about to change its ruler. I have seen men who saw it, men who were of full age at the time of its appearance, and who lived many years afterwards. The descriptions which I have just quoted, from the pen of the Norman poet and the monastic chronicler, fall far short of the marvelousness of Matilda's delineation of this comet, in the Bayou tapestry, where the royal needle has represented it, of dimensions which might well have justified the alarm of the terror-stricken group of Saxon princes, priests, and ladies, who appear to be rushing out of their pygmy dwellings, and pointing to it with unequivocal signs of horror. For independently of the fact that it looks near enough to singe all their noses, it would inevitably have whisked the world and all its sister planets out of their orbits, if it had been a hundredth part proportionable to the magnitude there portrayed. Some allowance, however, ought to be made, for the exaggeration of feminine reminiscences, of an object we can scarcely suppose to have been transferred to the embroidered chronicle of the conquest of England, till after the triumphant termination of William of Normandy's enterprise afforded his queen duchess so a magnificent a subject, for the employment of the skill and ingenuity of herself and the ladies of her court, in recording his achievements on canvas, by dint of needlework. But, on the eve of this adventurous expedition, we may naturally conclude, that Matilda's time and thoughts were more importantly occupied than in the labors of the loom, or the fabrication of worsted pictures, when, in addition to all her fears and anxieties in parting with her lord, we doubt not but she had, at least, as much trouble in reconciling the Norman ladies to the absence of their husbands and lovers, as the duke had to prevail on his valiant quens to accompany him on an expedition so full of peril to all parties concerned in it. Previously to his departure to join his ships and forces, assembled at the port of St. Valery, William solemnly invested Matilda with the regency of Normandy, and entreated that he and his companions in arms might have the benefit of her prayers, and the prayers of her ladies for the success of their expedition. He appointed for her counsel some of the wisest and most experienced men among the prelates and elder nobles of Normandy. The most celebrated of these, for courage, ability, and wisdom, was Roger de Beaumont, and by him William recommended the Duchess to be advised in all matters of domestic policy. He also associated with the Duchess, in the Regency, their eldest son Robert, and this youth, who had just completed his thirteenth year, was nominally the military chief of Normandy during the absence of his sire. The invasion of England was by no means a popular measure with any class of William's subjects, and during the time that his armament remained wind-bound at St. Valery, the common soldiers began to murmur in their tents. The man must be mad, they said, to persist in going to subjugate a foreign country, since God, who withheld the wind, opposed him that his father, who was surnamed Robert Le Diable, proposed something of the kind, and was in like manner frustrated, and that it was the fate of that family to aspire to things beyond them, and to find God their adversary. When the duke heard of these disheartening reports, he called a council of his chiefs, at which it was agreed that the body of St. Valery should be brought forth, to receive the offerings and vows, of those who should feel disposed to implore his intercession for a favorable wind. Thus artfully did he, instead of interposing the authority of a sovereign and a military leader, to punish the language of sedition and mutiny among his troops, 
oppose superstition to superstition, to amuse the short-sighted instruments of his ambition. The bones of the patron saint of the port were accordingly brought forth, with great solemnity, and exposed in their shrine, on the green turf, beneath the canopy of heaven, for the double purpose of receiving the prayers of the pious and the contributions of the charitable. The Norman chroniclers affirm that the shrine was half buried in the heaps of gold, silver, and precious things, which were showered upon it by the crowds of votaries who came to pay their respects to the saint. Thus were the malcontent Normans amused till the wind changed. In the meantime, William was agreeably surprised by the arrival of his duchess at the port, in a splendid vessel of war, called the Mora, which she had caused to be built unknown to him, and adorned in the most royal style of magnificence, for his acceptance. The effigy of their youngest son, William, formed of gilded bronze, some writers say of gold, was placed at the prow of this vessel, with his face turned towards England, holding a trumpet to his lips with one hand, and bearing in the other a bow, with the arrow aimed at England. It seemed as if the wind had only delayed in order to enable Matilda to offer this gratifying and auspicious gift to her departing lord, for scarcely had the acclamations with which it was greeted by the admiring host died away, when the long-desired breeze sprang up, and a joyful clamor, says Malmesbury, then arising, summoned every one to the ships. The duke himself, first launching from the continent into the deep, led the way in the mora, which, by day, was distinguished by a blood-red flag, and as soon as it was dark, carried a light at the masthead, as a beacon to guide the other ships. The first night the royal leader so far outsailed his followers, that when morning dawned, the Mora was in the mid-seas alone, without a single sail of her convoy in sight, though these were a thousand in number. Somewhat disturbed at this circumstance, William ordered the master of the Mora to go to the topmast and look out, and bring him word what he had seen. The reply was, nothing but sea and sky. Go up again, said the duke, and look out. The man cried out, that he saw four specks in the distance, like the sails of ships. Look once again, cried William. Then the master exclaimed, I see a forest of tall masts, and a press of sails bearing gallantly towards us. Rough weather occurred during the voyage, but it is remarkable that, out of so numerous a fleet, only two vessels were lost. In one of these was a noted astrologer, who took it upon himself to predict that the expedition would be entirely successful, for that Harold would resign England to the Duke without a battle. William neither believed in omens, nor encouraged fortune-telling, and when he heard the catastrophe of the unfortunate soothsayer, who had thought proper to join himself to the armament, shrewdly observed, little could he have known of the fate of others who could not foresee his own. On the 28th of September, 1066, the Norman fleet made the port of Pevensey, on the coast of Sussex. Wace's Chronicle of the Norman Conquest affords a graphic picture of the disembarkation of the duke and his armament. The knights and archers landed first. After the soldiers came the carpenters, armorers, and masons, with their tools in their hands, and planes, saws, axes, and other implements slung to their sides. Last of all came the duke, who, stumbling as he leaped to the shore, measured his majestic height upon the beach. Forthwith all raised a cry of distress. An evil sign is here, exclaimed the superstitious Normans. But the duke, who, in recovering himself, had filled his hands with sand, cried out in a loud and cheerful voice, See, signors, by the splendor of God I have seized England with my two hands. Without challenge no prize can be made, and that which I have grasped I will, by your good help, maintain. On this one of his followers ran forward, and snatching a handful of thatch from a roof of a hut, brought it to the duke, exclaiming merrily, Sire, come forward and receive Sezin. I give you Sezin, in token that this realm is yours. I accept it, replied the duke, and may God be with us. They then sat down and dined together on the beach, after which they sought for a spot on which to rear a wooden fort, which they had brought in disjointed pieces, in their ships, from Normandy. 
Matilda has, in a curious section of the Bayou Tapestry, shown us the manner in which the trusty followers of her lord carried the disjointed framework of this timber fortress to the shore. The soldiers assisted the carpenters and other craftsmen in their arduous undertaking, and the duke encouraged and stimulated them, in this union of labor, to such good purpose, that before even fall they finished their building, fortified it, and supped merrily therein. Here the duke tarried four days. William had, through the agency of Matilda's brother-in-law, Tostig, arranged measures with Harfager, king of Norway, that their attacks upon England should be simultaneous, but the contrary winds which had detained his fleet so long at St. Valery had speeded the sails of his northern ally, so that Harfager and Tostig entered the Tyne with three hundred ships, and commenced their work of rapine and devastation a full fortnight before the arrival of the Norman armament. Harold was thus at liberty to direct his full strength against his fraternal foe and Harfager, and the intelligence of his decisive victory at Stanford Bridge, where both Tostig and Harfager were defeated and slain, reached William four days after his landing at Pevensey, while he lay entrenched in his wooden citadel, waiting for a communication from his confederates, before he ventured to advance farther up the country. On receiving this unfavorable news, William manifested no consternation or surprise, but turning to his nobles, said, You see the astrologer's prediction was false. We cannot win the land without a battle, and here I vow that if it shall please God to give me the victory, that on whatever spot it shall befall, I will there build a church to be consecrated to the blessed Trinity, and to St. Martin, where perpetual prayers shall be offered for the sins of Edward the Confessor, for my own sins, the sins of Matilda my spouse, and the sins of such as have attended me in this expedition, but more particularly for the sins of such as may fall in the battle. This vow greatly reassured his followers, and appears to have been considered by the valiant Normans as a very comfortable arrangement. Hard work, however, it must have prepared for the priests, who had to sing and pray away the sins of all the parties specified, if we take into consideration who and what manner of people they were. Harold, meantime, was far beyond the Humber, and in high spirits at the signal victory he had obtained at Stanford Bridge, supposing at the same time that the Duke of Normandy had delayed his threatened invasion till the spring, as the father of Matilda had deceitfully informed him but the intelligence of the arrival of these unwelcome guests was too soon conveyed to him by a knight from the neighborhood of Pevensey, who had heard the outcry of the peasants on the coast of Sussex, when they saw the great fleet arrive, and being aware of the project of the Norman duke, had posted himself behind a hill, where, unseen himself, he had watched the disembarkation of the mighty host, and their proceedings on the shore, till they had built up and entrenched their wooden fortress, which, being done with such inconceivable rapidity, appeared to him like the work of enchantment. Sorely troubled at what he had seen, the knight girded his sword, and taking lance in hand, mounted his fleetest steed, and tarried not by the way, either for rest or refreshment, till he had found Harold, to whom he communicated his alarming tidings, in these words. The Normans have come, they have landed at Hastings, and built up a fort which they have enclosed with a fosse and palisades, and they will rend the land from thee and thine, unless thou defend it well. In the forlorn hope of ridding himself of this formidable invader, Harold offered to purchase the departure of the Norman duke, telling him that if silver or gold were his object, he who had enriched himself with the spoils of the defeated king of Norway, would give him enough to satisfy both himself and his followers. Thanks for Harold's fair words, replied William, but I did not bring so many ecus into this country to change them for his esterlins. My purpose in coming is to claim this realm, which is mine, according to the gift of King Edward, which was confirmed by Harold's oath. Nay, but you ask too much of us, sire, returned the messenger, by whom the pacific offer had been made. My lord is not so pressed that he should resign his kingdom at your desire. Harold will give you nothing but what you can take from him, unless in a friendly manner, as a condition for your departure, which he is willing to purchase with large store of silver and gold and fine garments. 
but if you accept not his offer know that he is ready to give you battle on saturday next if you be in the field on that day the duke accepted this challenge and on that friday evening preceding that fateful day for the saxon cause harold planted his ganfanon on the very spot where battle abbey now stands the normans and english being equally apprehensive of attack during the season of darkness kept watch and ward that night but employed their vigils in a very different manner the english according to the report of contemporary chroniclers kept up their spirits with a riotous carouse crying was sale and drink heel dancing laughing and gambling all night the normans on the contrary being in a devout frame of mind made confessions of their sins and employed the precious moments in recommending themselves to the care of god the day on which the battle was to take place being saturday withal they by the advice of their spiritual directors vowed that if the victory were awarded to them they would never more eat flesh on that day of the week an obligation which till very recently was observed by catholics in england odo the warrior bishop of bayou william's half-brother by the mother's side and goisfred bishop of countances received confessions bestowed benedictions and imposed penances not a few the battle joined on the fourteenth of october harold's birthday on a spot about seven miles from hastings called heathfield where the town of battle now stands when william was arming for the encounter in his haste and agitation he unwittingly put his hauberk the hind part before he quickly changed it but perceiving from the looks of consternation among the bystanders that his mistake had been observed and construed into an omen of ill he smilingly observed i have seen many a man who if such a thing had happened to him would not have entered the battlefield but i never believed in omens nor have i ever put my faith in the fortune tellers or divinations of any kind for my trust is in god let not this mischance discourage you for if this change in port aught it is that the power of my dukedom shall be turned into a kingdom yes a king shall i be who have hitherto been but a duke then the duke called for the good steed which had been presented to him as a token of friendship by the king of spain matilda has done justice to this noble charger in her bayou tapestry it is represented as caparison for the battle led by galtier giffert the duke's squire there is in the same group the figure of a knight armed cap a pay in the close-fitting ring armor and nasal conical helmet worn by the norman chivalry of that era with a gone fanon attached to his lance something after the fashion of the streamer which forms part of the paraphernalia of the modern lancer with this difference only that the gone fanon of the ancient knight was adorned with his device or armorial bearing and served the purpose of a banner or general rallying point for his followers the knightly figure in the bayou tapestry which i have just described is generally believed to have been designed for the veritable effigies of the redoubtable conqueror of this realm or at any rate as correct a resemblance of him as his loving spouse matilda could produce in cross stitch he is delineated in the act of extending his hand to greet his favorite steed the duke says wace took the reins put his foot in stirrup and mounted and the good horse pawed pranced reared himself up and curvetted the viscount of toise who stood by thus expressed to those around him his admiration of the duke's fine appearance and noble horsemanship never he said have i seen a man so fairly armed nor one who rode so gallantly and become his hauberk so well or bore his lance so gracefully there is no other such knight under heaven a fair count he is and a fair king he will be let him fight and he will overcome and shame be to him who shall fail him the normans were drawn up in three bodies montgomery and fitz osborne led the first geoffrey martel led the second and the duke himself headed the third which was composed of the flower of normandy and kept in reserve till the proper moment 
for its most effective advance should be ascertained by its skilful and puissant leader tail leifer the warrior minstrel of normandy rode gallantly at the head of the chivalry of his native land singing the war-song of rollo william had that day three horses killed under him without losing a drop of his own blood finding however that harold had succeeded in rallying a strong body of men around him on one of the heights with evident intention of keeping possession of that vantage ground till the approaching night should favor the saxons retreat he made his last desperate charge upon the people of the land in this attack it was supposed that harold was slain by a random arrow which was shot through the left eye into his brain the victorious duke pitched his tent that night in the field of the dead which in memory of the dreadful slaughter that had dyed the earth to crimson was ever after called by him the vale of sangulac this fiercely contested battle cost william the lives of six thousand of his bravest followers but malmesbury and other accredited historians of that time rate the loss of the saxons at three score thousand men when the duchess regent of normandy matilda received the joyful tidings of the victory which her lord had obtained at hastings she was engaged in her devotions in the chapel of the benedictine priory of notre dame in the fields near the suburbs of st Sever, and after returning her thanksgivings to the god of battles for the success of her consort's arms she ordered that the priory should henceforth be called in the memory of that circumstance notre dame de bonne nouvelle and by that name it is distinguished to this day the coronation of the mighty forefather of our present line of sovereigns took place at westminster on monday the twenty fifth of december being christmas day or as it is called by our saxon ancestors midwinter day splendid preparations were made in the sister cities of london and westminster for the celebration of the twofold festival of the nativity of our lord and the inauguration of the new sovereign on the afternoon of christmas eve william of normandy entered the city on horseback and was greeted by acclamations of the londoners he took up his lodgings that night at the palace in blackfriars where bridewell now stands early in the morning he went by water to london bridge where he landed and proceeded to a house near london stone where after reposing for a while he set forth with a stately cavalcade gallantly mounted and rode to westminster amidst the shouts of a prodigious multitude who were reconciled by the excitement of the pageant to the idea of receiving for their sovereign a man whom nature had so admirably qualified to set off the trappings of royalty next to his person rode the nobility of england and those of normandy followed up to that period so brilliant a coronation had never been witnessed and perhaps there have been few since that have surpassed it in splendor it is certain that there has never been one at which so many foreign princes and peers have assisted in consequence of the dispute between stignand archbishop of canterbury and the pope william chose to be crowned and consecrated by the hand of aldred archbishop of york to avoid the possibility of the ceremony being questioned at any future time he took not the crown however as a right of conquest but by consent of the people for the archbishop before he placed the royal circlet on his head paused and turned to the english nobles asked them if they were willing to have the duke of normandy for their king to which they replied with such continuous acclamations of assent that the vehemence of their loyalty more noisy than sincere had nearly been productive of the most fatal consequences william had surrounded the abbey and guarded its approach with a large body of norman soldiers as a prudential measure in case any attempt upon his life should be made by his new vassals and those trusty guards without the abbey mistaking the clamorous applause within for a seditious rising amongst the saxons with intent to massacre their lord and his norman followers in the first emotions of surprise and rage set fire to the adjoining houses by way of reprisals the flames rapidly communicated to the wooden buildings round about produced great consternation and occasioned the loss of many lives 
William, and the pale and trembling assistant prelates and priests within the church, were dismayed, and faltered in the midst of the ceremony, and with good cause. For if great exertions had not been used by the more sober-minded portion of the Norman guards, to extinguish the conflagration, which presently extended to the abbey, that magnificent edifice, with all the illustrious company within its walls, must have been consumed together. Some persons have considered this fire as the work of the Saxon populace, with intent to destroy at one blow the Norman conqueror and his followers, with such of their own countrymen as had forgotten their honor so far as to become, not only witnesses, but assistants, at the coronation of their foe. And this indeed is not improbable, if the Anglo-Saxons of that period had evinced a spirit capable of conceiving and carrying into execution a design of such terrific grandeur for the deliverance of their own country. We are, therefore, inclined to agree with all contemporary chroniclers in attributing the conflagration to the Norman soldiery, who could by no means be appeased till their beloved chief came out of the abbey and showed himself to them in his coronation robes and diadem. End of section 2